Sup, you beautiful bastards. Hope you've had a fantastic Monday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, hit that like button, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today is NASCAR, and then more specifically, Bubba Wallace. All right, so this story actually starts a couple of weeks ago, when Wallace, who is this series' current only full-time black driver, began driving this Black Lives Matter car. And look, Wallace didn't just stop at that car or the shirt that says, I can't breathe. He, he's actually been very outspoken about change in NASCAR and how that ties back to the nationwide protests that we've seen starting dialogue after dialogue dialogue all over the country. And in fact, on June 8th, we saw Wallace say this. My next step would be to get rid of all Confederate flags. There should be no individual that is uncomfortable showing up to our events to have a good time with their family that feels some type of way about something they have seen, an object they have seen flying. Um, no one should feel uncomfortable when, they're, when they come to a NASCAR race. So it starts with Confederate flags. Get them out of here. They have no place for them. And you know, here, as far as what the situation was, NASCAR had actually already banned the Confederate flag for use on all cars and official merchandise. Also back in 2015, they asked fans to not display the Confederate flag at races, but it had never officially been banned. However, just two days after Wallace made those comments on CNN, we saw NASCAR releasing a statement saying, the presence of the Confederate flag at NASCAR events runs contrary to our commitment to providing a welcoming and inclusive environment for all fans, our competitors, and our industry. Bringing people together around a love for racing and the community that it creates is what makes our fans and sports special. The display of the Confederate flag will be prohibited from all NASCAR events and properties. And from there, we saw Wallace cheering on that decision at a race later that day. Though at the time of that event, NASCAR really didn't have to worry about enforcing that rule because NASCAR had not actually started to allow fans back into stadiums yet. And so it wasn't until last night at the Talladega Super Speedway in Alabama that we saw fans returning to watch a race in person for the first time since the coronavirus lockdown. And at that event, what we ended up seeing was just universal acceptance of this ban. People standing shoulder to shoulder singing kumbaya, saying things like, we didn't realize that this was actually a flag that brought up a painful memory about slavery and saying their change of mind happened because NASCAR banned the flag. Also, I'm kidding. That is not, that's not what happened. People showed up in droves with these flags. In fact, reportedly hundreds of vehicles lined with Confederate flags formed a two mile long caravan and drove past the track entrance in protest. With one man saying the idea is to do it when people are trying to get in the gate. Also, if you looked up in the sky, there was a plane carrying a banner of a Confederate flag and a sign that read defund NASCAR. However, when, when it came to going inside the speedway, you did have reports of a lot of people putting away their flags. But ultimately, what we then saw was rain and lightning canceling the race before it even started. Now, with all of that, there's also another reason we're talking about this story today. And that's because yesterday afternoon, we saw NASCAR saying in a statement that a noose was found in Wallace's team's stall. And that news, that story obviously blew up. In one of the most emotional reactions last night, we saw NASCAR reporter Marty Smith telling SportsCenter, This sport is in a moment where this crap, this despicable crap, is not only not acceptable, but there's just no place for it. And who, whomever that is, I hope that you are so ashamed of yourself. I hope that you realize that that is someone's dignity and that is someone's positioning in this sport who has earned his place by talent and by hard work and he stood up for something that he believed and he asked for help from other people who believe similarly. You're not just hurting one or two people, whomever you are. You're hurting a whole lot of people who have made the decision that it's damn sure time to go be better. And it pisses me the hell off. And it pisses everybody else in the sport off who care, who care not only for Bubba, but for every single person that he is standing up for. You also had drivers like Dale Earnhardt Jr., William Byron, and Jimmy Johnson all voicing their support for Wallace with Johnson saying, I can't begin to fathom the pain this action has caused. I stand with you. Outside of NASCAR, you had athletes like LeBron James saying, sickening. Bubba Wallace, my brother, no, you don't stand alone. I'm right here with you as well as every other athlete. I just want to continue to say how proud I am for you continuing to take a stand for change here in America and sports. And with all of this, we saw this morning the hashtag I stand with Bubba trending on Twitter. And that, not only because of the news, but also because you had a number of people comparing this situation with Wallace to actor Jesse Smollett, right? A number of people trying to push the idea that this was a hoax and that Wallace himself planted the noose, which uh, I will say, I think highlights the anger and frustration associated with anyone that fakes a crime. Now, with that said, as far as finding out who actually planted that noose, NASCAR has said that it is launching an investigation, saying in a statement last night, we are angry and outraged and cannot state strongly enough how seriously we take this heinous act. As we have stated unequivocally, there is no place for racism in NASCAR and this act only strengthens our resolve 
resolve to make the sport open and welcoming to all. Also around the same time, we saw Wallace himself speaking out, saying today's despicable act of racism and hatred leaves me incredibly saddened and serves as a painful reminder of how much further we have to go as a society and how persistent we must be in the fight against racism. We will not be deterred by the reprehensible actions of those who seek to spread hate. This will not break me, I will not give in, nor will I back down. I will continue to stand proudly for what I believe in. Now since Storms canceled that race from happening yesterday, it was then held today. And actually right before it started in a very powerful moment, we saw the entire NASCAR garage, including all 40 drivers pushing Wallace's car to the front of the grid in solidarity with him. Wallace then getting out of his car, hugging the other drivers. This morning we've also seen the government getting involved. This morning we had Alabama Governor Kay Ivey releasing a statement saying she was shocked and appalled, as well as going on to commit to assisting in any way possible to ensure that the person responsible for this is caught and punished. Which on that note, we saw the news that the Justice Department and the FBI will begin investigating this incident as well. And here, I will say it will be very interesting to see what comes from these investigations because as several reporters for NASCAR have noted, even before coronavirus security measures were put into place, it was already incredibly hard for fans to get back to driver's stalls. And right? so because of that, you have many thinking that someone at NASCAR may have actually planted the news. Right, but with all of that said, at this time, we don't know who actually did it. We're obviously gonna keep our eyes on this one, but with all of that said, I would love to pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts about this? You know, what are your thoughts around the banning of the Confederate flag? What are your thoughts about what's happening with Bubba Wallace? Then in big business news though, I guess to be fair, only big business news to a select few, Microsoft is shutting down its competitor to Twitch Mixer, with Mixer also announcing that they are partnering with Facebook Gaming. And the reason I say this is big news to a select few is kind of two fronts. One, despite their best efforts, Mixer really never got to a place where they were seeing site-wide great numbers, always getting trounced by Twitch and YouTube Gaming. And two, a select few people that were huge on Twitch signed up to be exclusive to Mixer, right? And among those, including the first person to jump to Mixer, you had people like Tyler Ninja Blevins. His exclusive contract, according to Business Insider, landed somewhere between 20 and $30 million. And depending on how front-loaded that deal was, this may be the best news in the world for those that signed up exclusive to Mixer. Because, uh, according to a report from The Verge, stars like Ninja, King Gathalian, and Shroud will be released from their contracts, and Microsoft says it's up to them where they decide to go. With Vivek Sharma, the head of Facebook Gaming, saying it's up to them and their priorities. With The Verge saying this means the platform isn't actively pursuing exclusive agreements with any of Mixer's biggest names. Which to me would be weird if true. Like, Facebook Gaming has reportedly signed people to exclusive contracts. The, the one that comes to mind is Corinna Kopp. Right? That's pretty big news in December. She's a, a large personality. But also, maybe something has changed since then maybe they realize they haven't seen uh, the return from exclusive contracts, I don't know. But also, at the same time, we're also now seeing reports, because this, this story is still developing, that Ninja and Shroud were offered almost double of their initial Mixer deals. But according to this report, the streamers declined and instead forced Mixer to buy them out for an estimated 30 million and 10 million respectively. Which, if that is true, these guys just got the biggest W ever. Right, you got life-changing, if handled properly, generational money, and you don't have to finish out your deal in a place where, not, not to, beat a dead horse, but a place where your viewership suffered, where it was just a fraction of what it could be. Right, and so then they could go back to Twitch and get those massive viewer numbers, or they could go to YouTube Gaming or maybe get a different exclusive deal. Also for the people that are like, why would you take 30 million when you get 60 million? At the end of the day, after you have a certain amount of money, viewership is king. It's a thing that guarantees you the longest possible career ever. It gives you leverage in deals, and it'll also open up other profit-making opportunities in the future. But yeah, as of July 22nd, Mixer, is done. And I guess also a note that should be mentioned, I know the big names and the big money, that's what draws the most attention, but I also personally feel bad for the small creators on this platform. They most likely didn't get a heads up, and if you're on Mixer, that, that's probably a choice in hopes that this thing could grow and you could be a part of the rise, and this is where you've made your home, and then it's just gone. And granted, you do have Mixer saying, to Mixer partners, Facebook Gaming is ready to grant your partner status and to match your existing Mixer partner agreement as closely as possible. If you're interested, please check your email, visit the Mixer Partner Hub, or go here for details and how to transition your partnership to Facebook Gaming as seamlessly as possible. But at the end of the day, what you're looking at is a situation where you get a month to ask your audience to follow you to a completely different platform. Like, I can't even imagine what I would go through if I found out YouTube was shutting down in 30 days. And they were like, but don't worry, Facebook is willing to have you as a partner. One, that completely changes your business, and two, Trying to move an audience to a completely different platform is incredibly hard. Some people can do it. You, you look at the David Dobricks of the world. Massive on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. Then, hell, I mean, you even look at one of the people at the core of the story, Ninja. Massive numbers on Twitch, 
much, much, much smaller numbers on Mixer. And that's because platforms, user experience, and community matters. Which is why I think it's incredibly important, especially for new creators that are coming up, diversify. But yeah, with all that said, I'd love to know your thoughts on this story. But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today and today in awesome, brought to you by fullsail.edu slash Phil. You know, many of you beautiful bastards, along with a number of past employees of mine, have been Full Sail graduates. You know, and Full Sail grads have helped engineer Kendrick Lamar's last record, animated Steven Spielberg's latest movie, designed the latest Call of Duty game. And you know, if you got the dream, you got the drive, you know, that could be you. And also, getting a job in entertainment isn't just about who you know, but what you know. And so at Full Sail, you will get the knowledge and the hands-on experience, but you'll also get to connect with successful grads and students to build your network. And with Full Sail, you can study online or attend their Florida campus, and best of all, they offer accelerated degree programs. Full Sail specializes in entertainment, media, technology, and the arts, and that special blend has produced a community of inspiring creative people who push each other to do amazing things. So, if you want more info, be sure to head on over to fullsail.edu slash phil and check it out today. And the first bit of awesome, if you've watched me for the past few years, you know I'm excited about this. Hamilton. We got a trailer last night, not long before it heads to Disney Plus on July 3rd. Seeing the show in person with the original cast, one of my favorite life experiences ever. 70% of my daily music intake is Hamilton and the Spider-Man soundtrack. So yeah. I'm pumped. Then we got a trailer for Eric Andre's new special, Legalize Everything. We got the trailer for the Broken Hearts Gallery. We got Alicia Keys on NPR Music Tiny Desk Concert. And if you wanna see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, really anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then let's talk about a story that involves President Trump's campaign rally in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Right, a lot of people were looking at this event wondering what the hell is gonna happen? Right, even though you have things opening back up, we're in the middle of a pandemic, we're seeing the number of cases rising in a number of places. But at the same time, you had the Trump campaign boasting that there were around 1 million tickets requested. Right, and as we got closer to the event, we saw on Friday Trump tweeting, any protesters, anarchists, agitators, looters, or lowlifes who are going to Oklahoma, please understand, you will not be treated like you have been in New York, Seattle, or Minneapolis. It will be a much different scene. And that tweet, of course, faced a lot of criticism, many pointing to the fact that he just bulked in protesters to anarchists and people he deemed lowlifes. Also, as we got closer and closer to the event, one of the main talking points was that there was a fear that this could be a super spreader event for the coronavirus. Right, you hear a million tickets requested, Meanwhile, the indoor arena can only hold around 19,000 people. Right, and so not only would you have the people inside just packed very close together, but you would also have the people outside in the overflow area since apparently, once again, one million tickets were requested. And while the Trump campaign said that they would take the temperature of anyone who entered the arena, as well as hand out masks and hand sanitizer, they also said that the masks were not mandatory and refused to enforce social distancing measures. And this, even after it was announced that six members of the campaign team staffing the event had tested positive for coronavirus a few hours before it started. And all of this happening in an environment where the Trump campaign even had people signing waivers saying that they could not sue if they got the coronavirus. And so leading up to this rally, we saw numerous public health officials in Tulsa telling Trump and his campaign that they should absolutely not have this event. Especially because since the beginning of June, both Tulsa and Oklahoma as a whole have seen significant spikes in coronavirus cases. I mean, just two days before the rally, Oklahoma reported its highest single day of confirmed cases, though note there that number has since been topped by yesterday's numbers. But still, the rally was on and what we ended up seeing are lots of empty seats. In fact, and this is according to the Tulsa Fire Marshal's office, less than 6,200 people actually showed up, and that is a number not including campaign staff and media, which means that almost two thirds of the 19,000 seats were empty. And even beyond that, there were very few people outside of the arena as well. In fact, by early evening, that area was so empty that the campaign ended up scrapping plans for both Trump and Pence to address that overflow audience. So we see these pictures of empty space at the rally going viral. People also pointing to videos that were taken at the event, with a number of people noting that certain individuals individuals framed it in a way so you couldn't see where it was empty in the venue. And so as the situation was blowing up, we ended up seeing tons of TikTokers and K-pop bands saying that they were partially responsible, with both groups claiming to have registered potentially hundreds of thousands of tickets for the Trump rally as a prank. Right, and this connected to the Trump campaign's Twitter account posting a tweet on June 11th, asking people to sign up for free tickets using their phones. And following that, you had K-pop fan accounts starting to share that information with their followers, telling them to register but not show up. That trend then spreading to TikTok. Right, with videos there, people telling their followers to do the same, getting millions of views. And so what we ended up seeing is a lot of people and media crediting those groups for the low turnout. My personal favorite being the Fox News clip from this morning though. And there were these reports that teenagers on TikTok and fans of uh, the group K-pop took credit because they reserved a bunch of tickets never intending to show up. Ah uh, yes, the group K-pop likely teamed up with the hacker known as 4chan. Also, we, we saw the likes of AOC responding to Brad Parscale, who's Trump's campaign manager, tweeting you just got rocked by teens on TikTok who flooded the Trump campaign with fake ticket reservations and tricked you into believing a million people wanted your white supremacist open mic enough to pack an arena during COVID. But at the same time, you also have others saying that it's unlikely that this prank actually denied people any seats. This yes, because the entrance at the rally was first come, first served, not based on actual tickets. Though the counter argument that we've seen for that is 
is that if they were successful in making the Trump campaign think that there were way more people coming, and so the Trump campaign bragged about those numbers, a lot of people might've gone, well, if it could only fit 19,000 people, maybe we shouldn't even try. Our guy will be supported, we'll just watch from home. Right, but also understand all of that is just conjecture. Right, it's unclear exactly how much of an impact this actually had on the turnout. We've also seen Trump's campaign manager, Parscale, pushing back on the claims in a statement on Sunday saying, leftists and online trolls doing a victory lap, thinking they somehow impacted rally attendance, don't know what they're talking about or how our rallies work. Registering for a rally means you've RSVP'd with a cell phone number and we constantly weed out bogus numbers, as we did with tens of thousands at the Tulsa rally and calculating our possible attendee pool. With Parscale and other members of the Trump campaign also blaming protesters and media coverage of the coronavirus for low turnout, which is why we saw him tweeting on Saturday, radical protesters fueled by a week of apocalyptic media coverage interfered with Donald Trump supporters at the rally. They even blocked access to the metal detectors preventing people from entering, thanks to the thousands who made it anyway. But regarding those claims, numerous reports have said that there were only scattered protests in the areas near the arena. This with most of the larger protests that day taking place in other parts of the city. This after black leaders told protesters to try to avoid the area near the rally. Tulsa police also saying the few protests that were outside the arena were largely peaceful. And while there were reports of a few altercations, nothing escalated. In fact, one of the only things we saw, you had Tulsa police saying they arrested one woman at the request of the Trump campaign for blocking access to the rally. But at the same time, you had MSNBC reporters who were there and filming the incident saying the woman was not blocking access. And in this now viral clip from MSNBC, we see that woman who's wearing a shirt that says, I can't breathe, seemingly just sitting on the ground in a line of people. And there we see cops interacting with her. She says, I have a ticket. And then they forcibly remove her while she yells, they're arresting me. We also saw Par Scale pushing back with this photo, tweeting, sure, no blocked gate, CNN. If you think families with children will push through this, you're sick. But in response to that, we saw a number of people saying things, including an investigative reporter for the Frontier who wrote, hi, Brad, I was there covering it. Police shut down the gate for about 15 to 20 minutes, asked everyone to back up, which they did, and then started letting people in again. And there were at least two other entryways with no protesters. With others also sharing pictures and video of Trump supporters walking through those gates. And as far as what Trump said at this rally, I mean, he said a lot of things. He was just kind of telling stories for a bit. You know, among other things, we saw Trump bragging about how well he thinks that he's handled the coronavirus, saying to this group, largely not wearing masks, that he saved thousands of lives. Also, as has been the case recently, he hit on testing and said this. Here's the bad part. When you test, of, when you do testing to that extent, you're gonna find more people, you're gonna find more cases. So I said to my people, slow the testing down, please. They test and they test. We got tests that people don't know what's going on. We got tests. We got another one over here. The young man's 10 years old. He's got the sniffles. He'll recover in about 15 minutes. That's a case. Add up to it. That's a case. Following this, you had a White House official saying that Trump was joking when he was talking about slowing down the testing. I will say, personally, this is my opinion here, I do not believe that it was a joke. He was just joking. Defense has been used countless times by the campaign. A number of times it then comes back that he was not joking. I mean, just in an interview today, Trump refused to say whether or not he was joking while continuing to argue that the United States only has so many cases because it's doing so much testing. But also, I do want to note that this idea that increased testing is why the United States has so many cases, it, one, it's something that Trump has said a number of times, and two, it's false if not just misleading. If you have accurate numbers, you know how to best handle the situation. As the New York Times explains, the United States had conducted more than 26 million tests and recorded more than 2.2 million cases. But this still likely undercounts the scale of the pandemic and ramped up testing does not account for the high number of cases. Right, so if anything, we don't have enough tests, but it's that last part that's really key. Numerous experts have said that while it is true that you find more infections when you have more tests, that does not account for the high numbers we're seeing in the United States. And that's because when we talked about increased testing, we have to look at the percentage of tests that are coming back positive. Right, we need to compare how many tests are being done to the amount of those tests that are positive. That number is more reflective of where we are and that's exactly why more testing gives us a clearer idea. Because if it shows that positive cases are increasing faster than testing, it means that there are new cases. And last week, an analysis done by the Times found that the rate of positive cases is increasing faster than the average number of tests being given in at least 14 states. Right, and on top of all of that, numerous experts have said that there are no signs of coronavirus decreasing like Trump has claimed. In fact, as noted, recent reports from states show that it is increasing, and I mean, just today, it was reported that there are new spikes in at least 29 states, which once again could bring us full circle and also explain partly why the turnout was so low at the Trump rally. But ultimately, where I wanna end this story for the three people still watching, thank you for still watching and hitting that like button. Where I'll end this is if you are someone that is happy about this moment, you think that it is indicative that Trump will lose in November, I will say to you, the moment you think you've got a sure thing, you have already lost. If you get complacent, it is over. While the president is not polling great right now, 
things can change. Also, while the attendance at the event itself during this pandemic was low, there were millions of people tuning in online and on Fox News. Three, it's important to remember that the president has continually and continued today to sow seeds of doubt regarding the election, specifically regarding mail-in ballots, tweeting rigged 2020 election. Millions of mail-in ballots will be printed by foreign countries and others. It will be the scandal of our times. Then a few hours later, because of mail-in ballots, 2020 will be the most rigged election in our nation's history, unless this stupidity is ended. We voted during World War I and World War II with no problem, but now they are using COVID in order to cheat by using mail-ins. And that is happening while four, you have examples of stories like that of Kentucky, where tomorrow, instead of the usual 37 hundred polling places, right? That's what's expected. There will be fewer than 200, with the Washington Post pointing out that places like Jefferson County, the state's largest county home to 767,000 residents in the city of Louisville, will have one polling location. And also noting that that county has the largest black population in the state. Mail-in voting is more important than ever given the limitations of the current situation. And you have the president of the United States who is not polling fantastically right now, already calling the election rigged and referring to mail-in ballots as cheating. It is a deeply troubling situation situation and you should not in any way take anything for granted. And that is where I'm going to end today's show. As always, thank you for being a part of these daily dives into the news. Thank you for watching, liking the video, sharing it, being a part of the conversation in the comments down below. Also, if you're looking for more to watch right after this video, maybe you missed the last show or you want to check out my latest podcast, you can click or tap right there to watch that right now. But with that said, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow. I hope you like the video. Subscribe if you like it.